One, two, three, check one, two, three. One, two, three. This is a test. One, two, three. Check one, two, three. This is a test. One, two, three. Check one, two, three. This is a test. One, two, three.
O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come, ye, O come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels, sing an exaltation, sing, O ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, glory in the highest. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever circling years shall come the time foretold, when the new heaven and earth shall own the Prince of Peace, their King. And the whole world send back the songs which now the angels sing, which now the angels sing. Amen. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, family and friends and everyone online. Uh, we are gathered here uh, at the Long Island Church of Christ Sunday worship service. We thank you for everyone who came out today. Just some opening announcements as usual. Um, just asking you, uh, it's been up here for a while, just take precautions, wear your mask while you're in the chapel at all times. Make sure we're washing our hands, no hugging. And uh, if you're feeling sick, just stay home. You know, you can watch it online and uh, let's try to keep this going. You know, been going strong for a couple of months now and uh, prayerfully we continue in 2021 uh, to keep on meeting. Uh, if you have a device, turn it off this time. Uh, we ask you to put it on silent mode. And uh, with all that said, let's open up in prayer and let's honor God this time. Our mighty and great God and Father, uh, what a privilege it is, what an honor it is to come before the almighty God. And at this time in the year when the world, most of the world is still recognizing that you were born as a baby the almighty God who created the heavens, the earth, who spoke the stars into existence, that same God came as a fragile baby, delivered uh, to a young woman, and he became a man, and he died for the sins of this world, Father. And it is truly amazing. Our calendar revolves around this. There's so many things revolve around you and around your son. And we ask, Lord, as we have this opportunity to gather online as uh, physically as a church, just that we are putting all of our thoughts and energy on you and the men that will be leading us in song and in lessons. Uh, we leave this, these four walls, Father, more devoted, more committed, more on fire to the things of you, things that matter. Uh, we love you for sending your one and only son. We thank you for 
allowing us to gather to remember him and to honor him at this time. And we pray this in your son's loving and great name. Amen. Good afternoon, family. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Hosea, from the New King James Version, uh, verse chapter 14, verse 9. It reads, Who is wise, let him understand these things. Who is prudent, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, the righteousness walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Uh, for those of us who gave our life to Christ, you've already made one wise decision. So let's continue in making those. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. O oh, come, desire of nations bind, O oh, peoples in one heart and mind. Bid envy, strife, and discord cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, oh, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate where ox and lamb are feeding? Good Christian, fear for sinners, hear the silent word is pleading. Nail spear shall pierce him through the cross, be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The King of kings, salvation brings. Let loving heart enthrone him. Raise, raise the song on high. The virgin sings a lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary, the babe, the son of Mary. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So a little over 2,000 years ago, the son of the most high living God was born to a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem. 
And in five days, you and I, and over two billion people across the world, will celebrate December 25th, Christmas, commemorating the birth of Jesus. Now, in reality, we don't know precisely the day on which Jesus was born. Nothing in the scriptures tell us that. But we do know that it was at the right time. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5 tells us that when the set time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. What a joyful day that was. In Luke chapter 2, we see that the angels celebrated and praised God for the birth of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 9, we see the zeal for the Lord God himself for the birth of Jesus. We even see John the Baptist in, as a baby in Elizabeth's womb leap for joy when the baby Jesus came in, near him, as we read in Luke chapter 1. Yet interestingly enough, we don't see anywhere in the Bible or in the scriptures a call for us to celebrate this day. What we do see instead as Christians is that we're called to celebrate the Savior's death, burial, and resurrection. And we're called to do this by Jesus himself, as we see in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, where he says, do this in remembrance of me. And we do this. Take the Lord's Supper today and every first day of the week. And since I know that's Christmas, or as we like to call it, Christmas, is on many of our minds at this time of the year. I just want to take a few minutes at this time to connect the two, to connect Christmas and the Lord's Supper. So you can't have one without the other. See, the Lord's Supper without Christmas, the birth of Jesus, would just be another Sunday morning snack amongst friends. We wouldn't even be brothers and sisters. And Christmas without the Lord's Supper, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, would just be another holiday to sell toys and merchandise. If you could please turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10, we'll read verses 5 through 7. And it reads, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. See, this, this scripture is quoted from the book of Psalms, and it gives us a remarkable look at the heart of the Savior Jesus Christ before his birth. Jesus knew that he was entering the world to be the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. His body had been divinely prepared by God specifically for that purpose. Jesus was going to die for the sin of the world, and he knew it, and he was willing to do it. That was the whole point of his incarnation, coming here as a man in the flesh. Now, the importance of Christmas is not so much that Jesus came, but why he came. See, there was no salvation in his birth alone, nor did the sinless way that he lived this life have any redemptive force on its own. His example, as flawless as it was, could not rescue men from their sins, and his teachings, the greatest truth ever revealed to man, couldn't save us from a single sin on its own. There was a price that had to be paid for our sins. Someone had to die, and it couldn't have been me, surely enough, because of my sin, and it couldn't have been you, right? The only one possible was Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus came to reveal God's love to mankind and to fulfill the law. Of course, he came to call sinners to repentance and to heal the sick. Of course, he came to show us how to live and to minister to the needy. Of course, he came to serve and to demonstrate humility, to teach truth and to bring peace. But all those reasons are incidental to the ultimate purpose of why he came. He didn't have to be born as a human to accomplish these things. But there would be, where would that leave our salvation? That is why he willingly came to die. As people, we love the, Christ, the Christmas story, right? There's something special about a little baby, so precious and peaceful, simple and serene, that soft skin and that newborn baby smell. I mean, to watch a newborn baby sleep just strengthens and comforts the soul, right? But those soft little hands that were fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb 
were made so that nails could be driven through them. Those tiny baby feet that were unable to walk would one day stagger up a dusty hill to be nailed to the cross. That sweet infant's head with sparkling eyes and baby's breath it was formed that so one day men might force a crown of thorns onto it, and that he could utter the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That tender body, warm and helpless, lying in a cradle in the stable, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be stripped, whipped, and ripped open by a spear in his side. Jesus was born to die so that we who are dead in our sins might have life. Now, I don't think I'm trying to put a damper on our Christmas spirit here. It's far from it. See, Jesus' death, even though it was devised and carried out by men with evil intentions, it was no way a tragedy. In fact, it represents the greatest victory over evil that has ever been accomplished. It's appropriate for us to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ, but let us not make the mistake of leaving him as a baby in a manger. And let us keep in mind that his birth was just the first step in God's glorious plan for our redemption and salvation. And the triumph of Jesus Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection is what gives meaning to his humble birth. Amen? Amen. Uh, let us prepare to take the bread. Let's uh, pray for that. <clears throat> Your Heavenly Father God, as we come before you now, is preparing to take this bread which represents the body of Jesus. We just want to say thank you, Father. We say thank you because we know that Jesus, as he was with you from the very beginning of time, Father, but you desired a relationship with us, Father. You allowed him to come and Jesus willingly did, Father. As a child experiencing all the frailties of the human flesh, Father, experiencing all the pain, enduring it all, Father, that his body was just crucified on the cross, Father, on our behalf. We thank you for that, Father, and we do remember that now, as Jesus called us to do, Father. And we thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father God, as we prepare to take this cup, this fruit of the vine, Father, we want to remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilt on our behalf, Father. The blood that covers a multitude of sins. Father, sins that are still enumerating and are just increasing as, as, as the days continue, Father. Father, we know that that was the only way, Father. We know there was no other way, Father, but for the perfect, sinless Lamb of God to be crucified on that cross, Father. We thank you so much for that, Father. We thank you that we're able to commune with you now, Father. And we just we pray in this in Jesus' name.
the first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep no Of the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. All the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wing. Christ the highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Come, desire of nations, come, fix in us by humble home. Of the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace, silent night, oh, everyone. Pleasure to see all of you on this first day of the week to be gathered at this time to give thanks to God. Thank you, Brother Mark, for the great awesome reminder of the greatest event of all time, the visitation 
of our God in the form of a human being uh, illustrates the trait of God's character that I'm going to share with you today that I'm going to expand upon, and that is the compassion of God. And I've titled it The Womb of God. And when we think about a womb, uh, it's something feminine, usually. I mean, after all, men don't get pregnant, don't have babies. Only females are capable of doing such a thing. But interestingly enough, the Hebrew word that describes the compassion of God, its root word is the word womb. And it has this description of a tender affection for us. But not just a tender affection, but a safe place, just like the womb. Is a safe place for a human being to grow up. It's protected. It cradles us. It keeps us warm and close to the person that we're actually imaging in the flesh. If you think about it, the earth also itself is a type of womb, a place that God made and it's all the universe that is special, that cradles life, that is the perfect place for life to thrive. And even on the earth, during the time when the flood came, God made an ark. The ark was a type of womb where God kept that family of eight safe while there were harsh conditions all around it. And so now, ever since the advent of the church, the church has become that special type of womb, that greenhouse, where we're protected from external damaging forces, a place designed specifically to help us thrive even though everything else is harsh and unfriendly. So that is what this word rakum that we see in the Hebrew means. It has all these different meanings coming from that womb, that idea of the womb. As we read here in Exodus 34, 6, the passage that we've been examining, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. As I said, that is the Hebrew word rakum, which means full of compassion. And it's a special word attributed mostly to God, both in the New and in the Old Testament. If you look up the word in the Hebrew and in the Greek, most of the time, like 98% of the time, it's attributed to God because only God is able to show this kind of compassion that we're going to talk about today. He is the source of this compassion. And so the noun of, of this word, rakum, its verb, the adjective, all of them are related to the Hebrew word for uh, womb. So the image in the context draws out the nurturing nature of God, his tender affection. He makes known to us how much he cherishes us and how much he wants to soothe us in a gentle emotion of the mind. So this is the peace of God that's offered through Jesus Christ as we will continue to explore in today's lesson. We last left the lesson where Moses was coming down from the mountain with a radiant face after successfully mediating a covenant between Yahweh and Israel. His face was radiant, a visible sign of the glory of God to the people of his covenant, a sign that God was with them. And they've had many signs. That wasn't the only one. They saw the 10 plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the thunder, the clouds, the lightning on top of Mount Sinai. They even heard the voice of God. But this sign was going to be with them the longest, that radiance off of the face of Moses, indicating God's rakum, God's compassion for them, even in the midst of their disobedience and rebellion. It was a sign of his compassion that he cherished them because he knew Moses. Moses was known to him as a person who loved God. And Paul has something to add to this, another aspect to add to this here in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. He says here, since we have such a hope in Christ, right, we are very bold. We're not like Moses 
who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ it is taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So here Paul makes a contrast between what we would think would be an amazing sign of a radiant face. But Paul gives us a perspective. He says, look, what they were looking at was passing away at that very moment because it was a temporary covenant. And what we have today is the real thing in Christ. That's why he says in Christ, the veil is taken away. And therefore we are with unveiled faces. We boldly show the glory of the Lord as we contemplate him because we are being transformed. And that transformation, that glory that radiates from the church today, guess what it is? That first attribute of God's character, his compassion, that he shows through the body of Christ as we are compassionate with one another. That transformation is the sign of the spirit in us, bearing witness to Yahweh in us and working through us collectively as the church, the body of Christ, the aroma of Christ. We bear that radiance as we share this aroma, share his compassion, which is that first attribute of God that we are examining. In Psalm 24, verse 5, it kind of reads the same. I think Paul was thinking about this psalm when he wrote those words in 2 Corinthians, because it says here, starting in verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And so as we learn some of the aspects of God's rakum, God's compassion, let's see what that has to teach us as we now have the spirit of Yahweh to show compassion to one another. I think you remember the story of the two women who come before King Solomon because one of them claimed that one of the women had killed their child and had stolen the child. And so they both come before King Solomon saying, look, this is my baby. Both were saying the same thing. And we know the wise words of Solomon, right? He says, okay, give me a sword. I'm going to cut the baby in half. I'm going to give half to one and half to the other. And when that happens, the woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Give this other woman the living baby. Don't kill him. And so this picture shows us a, 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 the word picture of a deep compassion of a mother for the child of her womb. The word here in the Hebrew is similar to the Greek word used to describe the compassion of Christ, which typically is attached to the womb uh, or the entrails or the bowels. It's a deep stirring feeling coming from the pit of your abdomen. And when we show compassion towards someone else, we're coming close to our modern idea of empathy, something that moves us from the pit of our stomach. It's, it's something that's very powerful that moves us to do something. So it's not just the feeling in and of itself, but it's something that moves us towards action. This compassion is used as a parallel to other phrases like stirrings of the inner being or pity. And it's contrasted with anger because anger is also a deep emotion, but anger typically leads us to ego, to pride, to deception, right? It's like a self-protective thing. Whereas compassion works the opposite way. Compassion 
leads us to humility. Compassion makes us sober and leads us to doing good things, good things for us and good things for others. And this compassion is commonly used to describe God's response when his people cry out to him, as in this example in Nehemiah, where it reads here, you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven, you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hands of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. Israel here is depicted as constantly turning their backs on God, but God continually has compassion for them as they cry out to him. So the moral quality of the people doesn't seem to matter. God always listens when people cry out to him. He listens because he's deeply moved as a father is moved for their child. So isn't this an amazing characteristic of God to depend on? I mean, think about this. We can know what God's disposition is when we cry out to him. No matter how bad you may feel or how guilty you may feel, you can rely on the fact that God will turn his face to you when you cry out to him because that's who he is. He's a compassionate God and he wishes to show you and shower you with this compassion. In Isaiah, we see this depiction of God as a nursing mother. In this passage, Israel is accusing God of forgetting them and abandoning them. But God responds to them with this image. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. How interesting it is that God the creator of the universe in response to his people's rebellion describes himself first with this deep emotion of compassion. And, and both man and women reflect God's image and, and his likeness. So we shouldn't be surprised that God often uses a feminine depiction to describe this first attribute of his character. So here he's using what a mother would feel like for her son. And in this passage in Jeremiah, he's using this powerful image of himself as a parent to a vulnerable child. He says here is not Ephraim, my dear son, the child in whom I delight. Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. And, and here's, he's saying this about somebody that you may not feel the same way, but isn't it awesome that God uses these depictions, these images of his great compassion to reassure us that he hasn't forgotten about us. We may forget about each other. Indeed, even a mother may forget about her child. But God says, I will not forget you. Here's another parenting image. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. These verses show the character of God as well as our vulnerable nature. In all these examples, compassion is expressed towards someone in a more vulnerable position, someone enduring hardship. When we remember that every person, all of us here, share the same vulnerabilities, it helps us show that compassion towards one another. 
And like I said before, compassion is not just a feeling to be had. It's more of a conviction because it leads to action. Often the word compassion in the Bible is parallel to deliverance or forgiveness. Here we see as David pleads to his father, to God, after he knew what great sin he had committed, he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Here we see a heartfelt plea for forgiveness. David knew what he had done. And if you read this whole Psalm, he uses three of the five attributes of God's character from Exodus 34. So David learned to apply that golden calf story as an expression of his own sinfulness and also as an expression of God's consistent character. In David's mind, he knew God would forgive him, not because he deserved it, not because he was king of Israel, but because he could bank on God's great compassion. So that should be very reassuring to all of us if we're ever in a position like David was. Oftentimes we, we uh, are, feel so guilty, we torture ourselves with guilt or with thoughts that God would never forgive me when the exact opposite is true. God says, bank on my compassion. That is never changing. So we should all be like David and trust God's compassion. We shouldn't be like Isaiah describes here. Uh, he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Our ways and our thoughts are not going to lead us back to seeking the great compassion of God. If anything, our ways and our thoughts are going to drive us away from God's compassion. So he says, forsake your ways, forsake your thoughts, turn to the Lord. He will have mercy on them. It's still the same word, rakam, so compassion could be used there too. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. This verse shows again the link between compassion and pardon, but this time it's in reference to the wicked. God's compassion isn't just for the people who do right, who are doing right, who are morally upright. He needs anyone who cries out to him and he will give them his compassion. Of course, in order for that to happen, they have to forsake their thoughts and their ways. See, this is totally unlike us. We struggle showing compassion because we're biased. With When somebody does something to us that we can't understand and we would be inside our heads, I would never have done that to anybody. I can't believe they did that to me. I would never have done that. And you have those thoughts, you're showing your bias. You're saying someone doesn't deserve your compassion because you can't understand what they did. But God, as far as his thoughts are above ours and his ways above ours, he shows us great compassion when we seek him out. We're not like that. <laughs> we are biased. We're biased in showing compassion because we'll only show compassion to those that we relate to. Oh, yeah, I can understand why you did that. I probably would have done something like that. But if somebody else does something other, we're like, ah, you know, all of a sudden we get locked up in our pride and in our ego. And so we don't allow God's compassion and his comfort to flow through us when someone else may need it. Think about that. God does, he does let us experience the consequences of our sins. Yes. But he's always inclined to welcome us, as we see here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 2 and 3. It says, when you and your children return to the Lord, your God, and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. This is Moses, you know, predicting... <laughs> 
what he knew would happen because he knew he was dealing with a stiff-necked people as the Lord knew as well. But Moses says, remember also that God will have great compassion, so obey him, return to him. If he had to discipline you and scatter you, remember that he is still a compassionate God. So turn back. He's going to accept you when you obey him with all your heart and all your soul. We see that God's compassion is connected to deliverance. His compassion is what keeps bringing us back from exile because God is deeply emotionally invested in you, in all of his creation. He is responsive as any parent would be responsive towards his own child. That's how the Lord our God is. In Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the passages that we've been studying, uh, God says he is both compassionate and he is forgiving, but at the same time, he says he won't clear the guilty, thus presenting that tension that we've been exploring because he's got to put up and deal with us stiff-necked, prideful, and obstinate people. But understanding God's compassion helps us see God's nature who all, to all who turn to him. We become like Moses, that symbol of God's radiance when we allow that kind of compassion and comfort to flow through us. But we also need to remember that that comes when we don't judge what other people have done or when we're not biased as we tend to be. In order to understand God's compassion and be deeply moved by it, we need to first rely and bank on the fact that his compassion is consistent and that it's never left up to question. That even though God will not clear the guilty and will punish them, because he has such great compassion, he will always tip the scales to show us that compassion. Even though they, he might have already decreed some kind of punishment for us, if we humble ourselves and seek him out, we have the capacity to move him, to deeply move him, to show us grace and lift us up from any kind of punishment, just like it has happened time and time again in the biblical story. That, brothers and sisters, is faith. And that's the faith that Abraham showed when he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, the faith that Moses showed when he interceded for the people of Israel. And the faith that Jesus showed on the cross, dying while telling his executioner's father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the kind of compassion that comes from God. It is divine compassion. We should be so blessed to be able to allow that kind of compassion to be expressed through these very vulnerable and sinful bodies. Isn't that an amazing thing? But that really is what Christmas is all about, isn't it? I mean, God's virtue of compassion is most clearly seen to us today in the person, in the suffering person of Jesus Christ, as Mark so, articu uh, so well articulated in the lesson today. The New Testament uses two Greek words to describe this kind of compassion, and as I said before in the lesson, the two words are oiktirmos and splanchnon. The first one refers to actions of compassion or pity, and the second one is closely related to that Hebrew word, which at its root is the womb, the entrails, the bowels, a deep stirring feeling leading you to do something. And we see Jesus experiencing those deep emotions. In John 11, when Lazarus died, Jesus weeps with others. We see something similar in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus sees the crowds harassed, helpless, he says, like sheep without a shepherd, Matthew 9, 36. He knew they were vulnerable. 
He knew that they didn't have a real leader. And even though Jesus himself was in, a, in the most vulnerable state he was in, he had compassion because he is Emmanuel or God with us. He embodies the compassion of God. And where is that so more beautifully expressed than on a Roman cross intended to hurt, intended to be prejudiced, intending to pile up the guilt and the shame. But God took that and reversed it because that's what God's compassion does. It has the ability to do that. And so as God's compassion is a heartfelt response to the needs of his people, our compassion is in response to having experienced the compassion of God, as Paul says. We can comfort others with the experience of comfort we've had from God, but we can only experience that if we truly believe we can count on God when we have need, which is basically all the time. I don't know about you, but for me, it is always in my time of need. Yeah, that's now, next minute, and every, every day after that. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. And then here in Ephesians 4.32, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. You see here, compassion is tied to forgiveness. You can't have one without the other. Just as Christ forgave you. This is now how we put into practice the compassion of God amongst each other and amongst us in the world too. The ultimate example of that Forgiveness and compassion and rescue comes through the act of compassion of the cross. Hoping in God's compassion is to trust his consistent character as one who responds to those who turn to him, turning genuinely to him. And because of God's great compassion, now we have an unabated hope, an, un an unabated hope in his return from heaven. And that's the symbol of the empty grave. That's along with the radiance that the church expels are two things that fill us with unabated hope because we know his word is true and that that last fulfillment of his plan him coming back to take us home is yet to come. And so because of this assurance of these facts, not emotions, not philosophy, not some great story someone spin, but because of these truths and this assurance, now we can be moved to give our lives to Christ. The first step being baptized, being united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, recognizing that in me, I cannot have that compassion. I cannot express those things, but yet the God of heaven wants to express his very attributes to this broken body. Oh, I must give away this broken body in service of him. And so the first step is to be baptized, to be united with him in this way, and to become part now of a physical body, to let my physical body become part of something greater than me, so that collectively now we radiate the compassion of God towards one another and towards our community. Our empathy towards one another really is the practice of seeing other people in need of the compassion that we are in need of as well, no matter who they are. And we are most enabled to show compassion to one another when we really understand the compassion that God has had on us. Have a great afternoon. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shine the everlasting light. 
the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, and peace to men on earth. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly swinging o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Glory in excelsis Deo, And come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore our bended knees, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Excelsis Deo, glory in Excelsis Deo. Amen. Okay, this brings our Sunday services to a close. Uh, once again, thank you for everyone who joined us online, who came to the building today. And uh, we had two great lessons, uh, really just being reminded that Jesus Christ, yes, he was born as a baby, but that fragile hands, those fragile feet became a man. And ultimately he had to pay for the sins of this world. And Peter's just reminding us the compassion. We have a compassionate, compassionate God who is quick to forgive and easy to forget, easy to forget our sins once we turn back to him and really just renounce ways that were against him. Uh, guests, you are honored, honored guests. Please, please get take time tonight, this week. Just sit, sit down. Whether you've been reading the Bible for five minutes or for 50 years, just get together, sit down, open up the word of God together with everyone invited you out online or here, and really just see God's promises and God's words for you. Um, there is a men's order service meeting tonight at seven. That's going to be on Zoom. So we ask you to end the men's order service to join us at that time and to just um, be ready. And our next Bible class is not going to be this December 23rd. I know that much. Um, so I'm guessing the new year, um, whenever that may be, sometime in January. I can't think of the time. The first uh, Wednesday in January. So, um, you know, enjoy this Wednesday with your family. Enjoy the, the new year, uh, celebrating the new year. So the first uh, Wednesday in January, we'll have our next Bible class. There will be a Long Island Ladies Fellowship. I think this is new, so I'm going to go through this. A Long Island Ladies Fellowship. Uh, the topic will be seeing Jesus in the eyes of the storm. So uh, definitely it goes along with today's lesson, you know, the storms of life. And Jesus is there being compassionate. It's going to be Saturday, uh, January 16th at 11 p.m. Our sister Debbie Tamango or Deborah Tamango will be given that lesson and it's going to be the website zoom link um please contact diana uh, about that situation and um contribution continue to give uh, some great great work is being done here continue to give and continue to either do it the sunday before or the the saturday before depending on how you give whether through snail mail or through subsplash and um if you're planning to rejoin in person please just reach out uh email the directors so they can incorporate you on the schedule it's working out very nice, seeing different faces each week. And prayerfully, as we go through this situation, we'll all be able to gather as one big body again, um, God willing, in the near future. 
um, and streaming social media, please just take two seconds to thumb it up, uh, give the like so this message can go out um, throughout the world. And um, we will be streaming Wednesday Bible classes and Sunday services, the usual times, and just continue to share it. Whew, I think that's it. <laughs> So uh, it's a pleasure seeing all of you. Definitely use this upcoming week, this opportunity as we uh, interact with our family and friends. Just remind them, remind them of what this season's all about. That baby became a man. And the greatest, greatest gift we offer our family and friends is Jesus Christ and the salvation found in him. Amen. Let's uh, close in prayer. Our mighty and great God, uh, what a privilege it is to speak to you, to pray to you, the God who has made all things, Father. And we are so grateful once again that this world is recognizing at this time of the year, many uh, throughout uh, many lands throughout this whole world still hold to the truth that you became flesh, you were born as a baby, and it didn't stop there, Father. That was just the beginning of your compassion to this world. You had to see it all the way to the end, and you did mightily and powerfully and lovingly. And we are so blessed to know, not according to men, but according to your holy word, the men and women gathered online in this building, we stand before you completely forgiven. That is the greatest gift, forgiveness of sins. We have that. We have such a, a gift that cannot be fully understood or comprehended. Uh, as the scriptures say, inexpressible joy fills our hearts and minds, knowing that we've been forgiven of every wrong. And not only that, we have a Holy Spirit within us, a deposit guaranteeing the things to come. And we just ask, Lord, as we uh, go full-fledged into this uh, last week of this Christmas season that we are just looking to share this wonderful and precious gift with those that we love that do not know you, uh, that might have a head knowledge of you, that, that might acknowledge a baby, but after that, it, it's just, it's nothing to them. We want to give them the full extent of your love and mercy, which is forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit, which you promised through the prophets and you completed in your son Christ. And we ask, Lord, just as we leave this building. This building is, is not the church. We are the church. Those men and women who have your spirit, we are the church. And as we dispense from these four walls, as we go out into this world, that we carry this message of hope and of mercy and of compassion found in you only. Uh, we thank you for loving us so much. And we pray this in your son's loving name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plain Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy Repeat, repeat the sounding joy God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay Remember Christ our Savior was born one blessed day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. For Christ our Lord and Savior does bring redeeming grace. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. God bless you.